Today we're going to be talking to a producer who's worked with Quavo, Lil TJ, Pink Pantherus, Ty Dolla Sign, and most famously Kanye West on his new album Vultures. Not to mention his YouTube type beat channel which has over 100,000 subscribers and over 27 million views. In this video he's going to be showing us exactly how he's been able to land these major placements and also give us some source on how he's been able to grow his type beat channel to these crazy numbers, among a bunch of other topics. But to be honest, the interview turned out way better than we expected, Vitals dropped some insane gems about the industry if you're a producer you don't want to miss this one <laughs> all right we're here with vitals now multi-platinum billboard charting producer where did it all start how did you get into producing my story or my age group i feel like i don't really fit in with a lot of my peers because i feel like i had a very traditional come up in music i started as a musician very young uh, i was a drummer traveling drummer so i used to have like this permit and i used to go play for like bands and stuff when i was like six years old over the years that i picked up keys saxophone guitar bass and i didn't pick up producing until i was 11 years old which was 2013 2012 that's when like the peak of skrillex was just happening swedish house mafia avici rest in peace so i actually came up producing edm watching those guys so when would you say you got into making trap and the music you're making now my goal was never to be a, a hip-hop producer and it's funny enough my most successful songs in my discography are rap songs just which is great what got me into it is i remember being 15 16 and i still had the 12 year old dream of wanting to be like an edm artist Artist. But then I, I quickly kind of put that aside and realized I don't want to commit to the responsibilities of an artist and wanted to see how I could build a career in like rap and hip hop because that was the dominating genre at the time. I did the YouTube thing, which I still do. I tried to find a lane there, you know, instead of making like the trap card stuff, I thought I would try and go for the more 40 album cut vibe that's paid off very well. To be completely honest, like I love hip hop and trap and all that. My reason for getting into it wasn't because I started there. It was more so like I needed get my foot in the door so that's how i did it i was, I was probably like 15 16. okay yeah. do you remember how you made your first first money from music where you were like whoa yeah. this is legit i started local i was 15 years old going around san francisco like knocking on the doors of the studios asking if i could intern but because i was 18 no one would allow me but i would still find a way to like sneak into the networking events and be like yeah i make beats and they would have like an open aux which is like an open mic when everyone plays stuff and i would like network my beats and host my beats that way so at one point i was making my first like thousand off of like just Venmoing, getting Venmo from local artists. But I would say it really actually started once YouTube picked up because YouTube then became a platform naturally for me to get discovered by like other independent artists or even signed acts. So like a lot of my early placements were YouTube beats. When did you first go full time? How old were you? I guess it was just once I graduated school, I was always kind of doing it. I'm 21. So the pandemic actually helped. I would be in Zoom class and sessions with like big producers and I would just like to click and do that allowed me to go full on on YouTube and then that was able to make enough money to support myself. It's a blessing and a curse but I'm very fortunate to say that it always was full time. Every time I came home from school I was either doing one of two things. I was playing video games or I was doing this. That's and sick. I, I don't know what it is without it. Obviously been full time for a while now. What would you say your daily routine looks like at the moment? So 2024 what's your daily tasks? What are you doing? I know a lot of last year in the year before there was this huge culture and movement and of this philosophy of like wake up and grind every single day and if you're not pumping out five loops a day or in 12 million starters you know you're not going to get anywhere because you're not moving anything anywhere true granted i did that still 2020 2021 but nowadays my schedule is so all over the place it's kind of irresponsible but at the same time it relieves a lot of pressure most of my days are prep days for sessions with artists i really try and focus on okay what does this artist maybe need or what do I feel organically and how can I then throw that up onto a piano roll or my instruments. There's days where I'll wake up super late because I stayed up like last night I stayed up till five in the morning coming up with these guitar chords. <laughs> Shit. My daily routine could be waking up doing YouTube and then going to the gym and then getting a smoothie and then buying clothes or something. Like other days it's a session so I wake up make myself breakfast and then I'll head into town and go to the session that I have to do whether that's writing a new song with the artist finish 
publishing a new song with the artist. A lot of other days, it's a demo catch-up day. So maybe I'm with songwriters working on a bunch of pitch demos that I have to actually produce out. I'll write the song with the writer and then I'll bring it home, finish it, and then send it to my publishers for them to pitch. So it's, it's a mixed bag. Like, obviously, there are times of scheduled organization that comes in. For example, like London on the track, great mentor of mine, him and I work very closely. When he's in town, it's, you know, we wake up, go to the studio whenever, and we're there all day. It's seriously all over the place. Yeah. Do you think the more like producers get into industry and, and studios and stuff, the more their days is just like mixed around with what they've got to do because it isn't always like organized? I think in the early stages, a lot of it is just impulsively going. Sure, whatever. It's 4 a.m. Doesn't matter. You have a dream to chase. Go ahead. That's right. The more successful you are and you have the ability to make these kind of luxuries of saying, no, I can only work around this time. Well, not with everybody, but you know, with obviously large mainstream artists, I'm still in the boat of I'm on their timing. If Kanye is in town for the hour, I'm there, you know. You brought up London on the track just there. Obviously, we've seen on your Instagram and your placements and shit, you've linked up with London on the track heaps. You said he's your mentor, obviously. He is one of them for sure. Tell us about your relationship with him. How did it come about? How did he become your mentor? What's the story behind that? The story actually starts with another big producer. It starts with Mustard. When I was in high school, a lot of the time on YouTube, I was posting Roddy Rich and Mustard type beats. They went pretty viral. And then he had reached out to me and my manager, Mike, by the way, I wouldn't be anywhere without you for watching this. He flew me out because he wanted to sign me after hearing those beats. Through Mustard was Mustard's go-to guitar guy, Cam Griffin. And if you guys know who Cam Griffin is, great friend of mine too. The best guitarist I know. I used to stay on his couch when I was in high school still, when I was in LA. So fast forward, when I moved here, in that in-between time, Cam ended up doing a lot of the Summer Walker stuff with London. So he then introduced me there because London was looking for, I think he tweeted a long time ago, like who's the best FL guy. And since I had like an EDM background, I knew FL like the back of my hand. He then told me, yo, pull the studio. And then I met him. Then literally that day onward, we went on like a three week stretch of just working every day. I owe a lot of my recent success to London. You know, I'm very thankful for him. That's kind of how that started. We still work a lot to this day. Like, if you track back, it started really from you posting those mustard type beats on YouTube. That's crazy. Mm -hmm. Is there a lesson there for producers at home to just, I guess, put your stuff out there? Absolutely, there's a lesson. But there's also, there's multiple lessons and I don't think the main takeaway is to put your stuff out there. The main takeaway is to double down on what you do and be about it. Be a good person and be smart. All of those opportunities, if I were any younger, I easily could have fumbled. I think just knowing how to maneuver certain situations when the opportunity is presented is super valuable. And to be honest, I don't think you learn that until you learn it the hard way. Just as successful as that timeline has went, it easily could have been the exact opposite. Yeah. yeah. If you have like a like a mentor bringing you on under their wing, like understand your role, play your part in that team. What program are you using now if you're not using FL Studio? I'm unable to know. Okay. In studio sessions you've been in, is there one like door that everyone focuses on or are they throwing ideas in from different things? What is it like in oh. those rooms in terms of collaboration? Very different depending on the artist. There's some days I don't even touch the DAW. There's some days I'm just having a guitar and it's me and the artist writing lyrics. There's other days when it's three computers all feeding into one computer and we're all air dropping to Pro Tools session. We'll get into some placement talk. Your Kanye placement recently. First of all, congratulations. It's a Thank you. big achievement. Every producer's dream placement. Yeah, definitely one of mine. What's the story behind Big Forgiveness, the production of it, your part, how it came about? Yeah, London had a huge huge hand in Vultures. Kanye had called them on to work on a lot of the songs. Throughout that process, I was also working on them with him for Beg Forgiveness. Lana and I really just went in on like since. If you listen to the song, there's certain lines like protector in the night, da, 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 da. you hear like an octave jump on the pads or all the atmosphere that isn't the bass line. Cause the song was already written. It was more of just how can we enhance the song to be what it is. Okay. But after a couple of revisions, it was then presented and Ye liked it. It was not easy. It's like, how how do you appeal to someone like him? Like that, that's a huge thing and it it was very important for me to not produce as a fan, but produce as a servicer. But yeah, me and London, for the most part, we were just going back and forth. Like it was really helping me guide, guide my mentality on where to go with it. Like, okay, yeah, you're this 20 year old kid and you have a yay opportunity. You're probably gonna overdo it a little bit. Do you remember when you did hair was it actually on the album? Do you remember what that was like? Yeah, little TMI, I was showering <laughs> and then my, my phone started blowing up. It's out, it's out, it's out. I'm like, what's out? Everyone's like, are you wanted? Are you wanted? Are you wanted? And then I got out of the shower and I was like, 
Yes. <laughs> and, then I went back into the, and then I went back into the shower and then I came back out because I think it dropped really late at night and then I went to sleep and then I woke up to a bunch of messages in my phone. So it, it was very surreal. Yeah. Um, literally every artist, even if you have paperwork done sometimes, you know, last minute changes can happen. So that's why I think no matter how many cuts you have with somebody, don't bank on any of that. Double down on your own skills and believe and be self-sufficient that way rather than rely on the fact that you're getting placements. Because at the end of the day, you never know if they'll come out or not. How are you getting placements? Like, is it more like using your guitar? Is it you doing the drums or is it just random? There's no one way to get placements in 2024 yeah mm. i really want to make that clear it doesn't matter who you are there's no one way to get placements like all my next releases i either did i don't know like sometimes i did the guitar sometimes i did the bass sometimes i did like, the whole thing i started out kind of as a loop guy but i never really indulged into it fully like I, I used to send stuff out a lot but now my everyday life is more centered around wherever i'm needed or whatever the song needs there's so many ways like even for pop stars or whatever k-pop like you know just a hook idea that's just on a guitar and a vocal can travel far enough to where it gets you even a number one song sometimes. And it's not like you were any less involved. I think it's been a very long time since I thought of how am I getting these placements? It's more of like, where am I needed? And then I'm there. What part has your type B channel played into you getting placements? Honestly, I wouldn't be anywhere without my channel. If you if you look at my channel, I treat my channel very seriously. I, I try not to clutter my uploads with a lot of uploads. I almost treat it like it's a solo album or a solo project, like an artist career. It's financially supported me when it's needed to. It's given me something to do. It's challenged me. The, the reality is, views plateau a lot sometimes for a lot of YouTube producers and like trying to figure out what still is cool. How can you keep YouTube beats fresh and inspiring for a new generation of artists? And I think that's the mentality that really has kind of kept my channel alive. You know, the common thing is, oh, these beats are, these type beats are selling right now. So I should do that because I've treated YouTube as more of a personal creative outlet sometimes rather than just as a way to make money. It's really rewarded me. I like that idea of what you said about almost like the solo album yeah. it's so cool thank you I, and in terms of placements like percentage wise it's done a lot like maybe 40 to 30 percent of my catalog was from youtube okay uh -huh. shit what about people hearing your youtube beats and maybe they got onto you because of those beats or they heard that loop and then they messaged you just for that loop has stuff like that happened people hitting you up because of your type beat channel and that leads to placements yeah that actually does happen like i think if you're a producer on youtube don't sleep on the fact that that's a possibility some of the biggest artists in the world sometimes are the biggest rappers they still they still go on youtube you know there's always this stigma of oh my god youtube the type beat game is oversaturated if there's a million aspiring producers in the world i can probably guarantee you there's like 30 million aspiring artists in the world if not way more that number is probably 10x it's only saturated if you want to participate in a saturated market and it's easy to do because that's when you go on youtube and you search it up that's is what's selling so it's like, oh i gotta get in on this bag the most successful business in any industry weren't successful because they copied what another person did. There was always something a little different. Like obviously, people hear advice and it's usually just oh, consistency, a pick a niche and stuff, but it's cool to hear your perspective on this. But that's still needed. Don't get it twisted. That's still needed. There's times where lack of consistency has hurt my channel. It's true. Like You need consistency and you need to deliver. If you had to restart your music producer journey in 2024, apart from being consistent, is there anything else that you would be like, I right, that needs to be done to ensure you succeed. Reaffirm what I love about music. What is the artist or the album or the genre that keeps me up at four in the morning digging for more artists who sound like it or more songs or whatever? I think establishing the fact that you can be inspired is step number one. But just identify what you like. After the fact, think what is a way I could refine my skills. Learn how to use your DAW. And I mean really know how to use your DAW. Creativity is all over. Creativity is something that flows around the universe and if we're lucky enough we catch something and then we make it the issue is when you catch the idea but then you don't know how to execute it yeah you know you get there by a combination of knowing your dog and studying songs you like and i think after i think instruments is a must i mean it's not a must i, I mean it's funny it's kind of a hot take it's a very it's, it's actually a very hot take because 
a lot of people in today's current climate who are always like, you don't need instruments and all that. You don't need to know how to play these things, which is true. You can still be absolutely successful. But I think that advice is a little bit aged now because as we start to leave the era of the biggest producers who don't play instruments and going more into modern times where you have other genres that are demanding of more instruments, I don't ever think shy away from it ever. I, I think there's a big misconception of people saying, oh, you don't need to learn just because you don't need to doesn't mean you should it. I just think learning instruments not only unlocks more opportunity for you, it unlocks understanding that you would never know how to replicate on a computer. Step one, know what you like, why you like it, understand you like music. Step two, learn your DAW. Step three, pick up instruments. Lastly, I think everything beyond that is then you start asking the most challenging question. What makes you different? And that's where you then reference step one. What inspired you? How can you then expound on that with this skill set that you've now developed and then implement that into the things you're working? That's how I would, re I would restart it. From there, you've got your craft, you've found your style, let's say, you've got something that's a little bit different. What would the steps be to get your music out there? I don't think it's worth pursuing anything I'm about to say without at least having like three of those last previous steps. I then would say it's 2024. Be creative with how. There is no restriction. I'm not going to sit here and say, yeah, make a type B channel because that's what I did. Just because it worked for me doesn't mean it'll work for you. And maybe it will. Or just the way like how Nico, Nico Baron, he's going crazy on TikTok with all his loops and he has viral songs and now he's putting songs out himself and he's fire. I didn't do that. That's something he did. He was creative with that and did that a way to get yourself out there there's obviously the egregious way of like dming a bunch of producers and trying to get in contact which is absolutely true but also be smart about how you do that and also most important content's king right now and content will get you discovered but i think the biggest issue when people say that is they take that advice too literally they'll do content in formats that are seen and expect it to work you're not engaging something off of someone something they've already seen a million times so i would maybe try a form of content that's different but that also don't shy away from face-to-face -face marketing don't shy away from being local if you're in a generation and you stay tight with your generation all your generation is going to go up together you know get to know your generation i like to look in generations of music as like classes like class of 21 class of 22 for your future what are your i guess goals what do you see yourself in five years and then maybe 10 years, where do you see yourself? Mm -hmm. Obviously there's materialistic things I would like, as in like more placements, obviously. Who doesn't want a cut? I would love more major label stuff. But most importantly, I wanna be a part of a project that inspires a generation. Because to me, that's what I always fall back on as a producer slash musician. I wanna be a part of an album that is that album that an artist always comes back to or an aspiring producer. For me, it's Blonde by Frank Ocean. I go back very often and not for the notoriety so I can wear it on my sleeve, more so because I know the kind of high in that feeling. And granted, if that means billboard charting success, obviously I want that too. Who doesn't want a number one, you know? But I like to buy a nice house and drive a nice car. Absolutely. May as well. Also, yeah, who, who doesn't, you know? Five years, I'd say I want to be part of more projects that I really feel fulfillment in. 10 years, I want a big house. <laughs> Fuck yeah. Sweet Thanks guys. for that, bro. Of course. Catch you later, bro. Peace.